Hello and welcome. This is Dianis Whiskers from Whiskers Educational Materials. That's V E M Online.net. Last time we talked about deep longitudinal line and how it compensates for posterior oblique system. So let's review that one more time. Deep longitudinal line consists of biceps femoris, same side gluteus maximus, underlying sacrotuberous ligament same sides erector spinae muscle group and opposing sides latissimus dorsi posterior oblique system which is one of major systems in our body consists of gluteus maximus opposing sides latissimus dorsi and thoracolumbar fascia in between in my previous video i was talking about how latissimus dorsi and gluteus maximus are biggest muscles in our body but at the same time they tend to underperform they tend to get lazy so to say gluteus maximus should be our main hip extensor if for some reason gluteus maximus is underperforming biceps femoris which is part of the uh, deep longitudinal line is going to compensate for that this condition is called gluteal amnesia Our body primarily should rely on posterior oblique system and anterior oblique system. POS in short and AOS in short. Posterior oblique system from behind and anterior oblique system from the front. Posterior, anterior. Now, some of the things that I said in my previous video may seem a little confusing. What I was trying to say was that posterior oblique system should be one of one of the what i was trying to say was that if posterior oblique system is underperforming for some reason deep longitudinal line will compensate for that now deep longitudinal line consists of biceps femoris and erector spinae muscle group on the same side as well as gluteus maximus, latissimus dorsi on opposing side, and sacrotuberous ligament lying just underneath gluteus maximus muscle. And this is where the confusion kicks in. Let's discuss what's desired and what's not desired. Both of these muscles, gluteus maximus and biceps femoris, both of these muscles will tilt the pelvis towards the back. So we are talking about posterior pelvic tilt. Pelvis tilting backwards. Tight lower erector spinae muscles will contribute to anterior pelvic tilt, which usually is not desired. Normally, we should have strong gluteus maximus, and biceps femoris shouldn't be the main hip extensor. In this scenario where deep longitudinal line is compensating for posterior oblique systems weakness or underperformance so to say we will end up with tight lower back muscles inhibited gluteus maximus muscle and tight biceps femoris problem in this region is that we will actually lose power if biceps femoris becomes main hip extensor we are not using gluteus maximus to its full potential. Tight lower back muscles are never desirable. Tight lower back muscles will contribute to hyperlordotic lower back. Talking perfect posture, increased lordotic curve is not desirable. Increased lower back lordotic curve means that pelvis is going to be tilting towards the front anterior pelvic tilt if pelvis is tilted towards the front we will likely have tight lower back muscles tight deep hip flexors and at the same time underperforming gluteal muscles 
and underperforming abdominal muscles, especially obliques. Now, this situation is called lower cross syndrome. Lower cross. Our body's musculoskeletal system is in this state of ongoing tug of war between one side structures and other side structures. So talking front to back, normally we should rely on anterior oblique system from the front and posterior oblique system from the back. There's ongoing tug of war between internal rotators and external rotators of the shoulder joint. There's ongoing tug of war between flexors and extensors of the elbow joint. And there's ongoing tug of war between muscles that will tilt the pelvis toward the front and muscles that will tilt the pelvis toward the back. Talking shoulder joint, internal rotators will be always much stronger than external rotators. So there's going to be tendency to forward roll our shoulders. Talking hip joint, muscles that will tilt pelvis towards the front will usually have tendency to overpower muscles that will tilt the pelvis backwards. As I just mentioned, there is always going to be tendency for pelvis to tilt towards the front, which is not desirable. With anterior pelvic tilt, there's going to be tendency to increase lordotic curve as well. That means lower back muscle tightness, deep hip flexor muscle tightness, abdominal oblique muscle weakness, and gluteal muscle weakness. In this scenario, gluteal muscles from POS and abdominal obliques from AOS are slack enough. Now, how and why do we get into this state? And how can we correct that? So first of all, before any global movements, I'm talking about moving upper limbs, lower limbs, we should engage our core. Now this requires a lot of practice. So what does that mean, engaging your core? So basically we need to keep our pelvis right in the middle of maximum posterior and maximum anterior pelvic tilt. So right in between maximum rotation towards the front and maximum rotation towards the back. So there is middle point, we should keep it that way. What are core muscles? From the front and from the side, that's anterior lateral aspect, transversus abdominis. From the back, that's posterior aspect, multifidus. From the top, superior aspect, diaphragm. And from below, that's inferior aspect, pelvic floor. These muscles should engage prior to any upper limb and lower limb movements. These muscles are constantly working. At the same time, posterior oblique system is constantly working as well, just to keep our posture erect. This brings us to point number two. We should primarily rely on anterior oblique system from the front and posterior oblique system from the back. Anterior oblique system and posterior oblique system are our strongest muscular systems in our body. And we should keep it that way. If these systems will start to slacken up, so to say, we will start to lose this tug of war between anterior pelvic tilt and posterior pelvic tilt. As I said, there is always going to be tendency for our pelvis to rotate towards the front. And we should oppose that as much as possible. At the same time, we don't need completely flat back. Proper physiological curves are needed to absorb the shock. So we should have normal trachykyphosis, normal lumbar lordosis, and then actually we'll have another lordosis in the C-spine and another kyphosis in sacral region. So there are actually four physiological curves and we actually need them. But we don't need excessive lordotic curve. But we don't need excessive lumbar lordosis. 
We should avoid that at any cost. So number two is basically do our best to fight this tug of war. If we do both of these things, happy life, happy wife, peace on earth, life is great.